Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the second session of the Spring 2018 Sunakesis Digital Classics module. Um, this is a nine-week mini-module um, which will be followed by the summer of 2018 uh, module, slightly longer than run by uh, Monica Berti. Um, but this, um, this nine-week module will uh, include a um, handful of presentations um, on topics around um, digital uh, language and uh, text technologies primarily. Um, so uh, today's session is on collaborative editing and we're joined uh, by Emma Bridges and Lucia Vanini, both from the Institute of Classical Studies, University of London, um, who will talk about this and I will, I will kick off with a very short um, uh, introduction to the concept of collaboration and um, we'll uh, follow up um, from there. So uh, give me a second to pull up my slides. Uh, okay, I think you're seeing my slides now. Um, so I'm not going to go through all these slides in detail, but um, what I want to do basically in this um, brief introduction is talk about the, um, the concept of collaboration and the concept of asynchronous collaboration. Um, by this, um, it's something that we mean the way you collaborate with people who you're not necessarily in the same room as, you're not necessarily working on the same project at the same time as, um, but you're building on their work in some way, um, either because they've made the work available um, for other people to build on or because they wrote this so long ago that you know everything we do um, inevitably builds upon it. Um, and as will be clear from the way I've described that, that's that's actually all scholarship is asynchronous collaboration with um, with everyone who's worked on the same topic before. Um, so I'll start off by um, talking about how the open source software model um, uh, is, is a fairly good uh, sort of analogy for this sort of asynchronous collaboration. And then I'll finish up by pointing out that that's not actually an analogy. That's actually exactly what, what we do or what I'm recommending we do. Um, but um, the open source software model, um, sometimes called the free software model, although they stress that they mean free as in speech, not free as in beer, um, because this is um, the production of software that is made available for other people to use um, in an open and liberal way, um, one way or another. Um, the idea being that this software, and in particular the code behind the software, um, is a community good. Um, it's collaboratively created, um, and it's potentially collaboratively created by people who don't necessarily work together. Um, they, um, you know, they may be a bunch of coders in San Francisco who produce the software for one reason, and then someone comes along sometime later um, at the other side of the world and you reuses part of it and publishes a new piece of software based on that. And then other people might take the original authors might take back those improved versions, but someone else might do so, and the original authors may choose not to take them back. Um, so this is effectively a software management model. <coughs> And it's a, it's a model that's used a lot um, by private industry. Um, it's not by any means um, just some sort of, uh, you know, wishy-washy academic thing where we, we, you know, we claim what we're doing is free when it's, when it's not really because, you know, all our salaries are paid by, um, by, by the universities. I mean, it is something which is it's very important um, in, um, in private industry. Um, the, um, the open source um, model works um, as a result of uh, open source licenses which um, explicitly make your software available for other people to reuse um, in one way or another. There are many different kinds of licenses um, that um, you can attach to your software to, enable, to permit other people to reuse them. Um, usually these will allow reuse and redistribution of your software. Um, usually they'll allow modification of it as well, otherwise there's not really much point. Um, some of these will allow commercial use of your software. Some of them will say you can reuse this software so long as you don't make any money out of it. Some will say you can use this software so long as your what you create is open source in turn. Some don't have that further restriction. Um, and uh, the, the point being that this um, this doesn't uh, create a complete free-for-all, but it does allow reuse under certain constrained um, uh, conditions of your of your software. Um, so this is not the same as public domain software. A piece of public domain software code would be um, something that's completely free that you create and anybody can do anything they want with it in legally, um, including 
um, pretend that they wrote it. Right? If it's if it's public domain, it's like you know the work of the work of Shakespeare. You can take some of the work of Shakespeare and you can republish it under your own name. And although everyone knows that's a bit that's you know it's a bit of a weird thing to do and it's plagiarism and there's all sorts of reasons why that's the wrong thing to do. Legally, there's nothing wrong with it. So public domain software would be in exactly that situation. Open source is not quite like that. Um, open source works within the copyright law. So this is taking something that you have copyright on and permitting people to do some things, not everything but some things that copyright would not normally allow them to do. And this is particularly important for, for copyright, um, for, for software, um, because unlike, for example, um, you know, theatrical drama, um, the odds are that software is no longer going to be useful um, by the time copyright has expired on it. You know, we're still reading um, uh, theater plays more than 70 years after the death of their author, so you know, copyright doesn't, you know, um, doesn't, doesn't, uh, destroy the possibility for for for, um, for reuse, um, whereas with software, with software it does. So, um, as I've said, this this enables people to to collaborate on software without without necessarily ever meeting or even communicating with each other. They may not they may not be working on this for the same reason, and they may not know each other um, as they as they do so. Um, and so that that as I say, that's that's a, sort of a very brief um, background to open source. Um, uh, software as a as a movement, um, and I want to show how that is basically exactly what we've always done in scholarship in academia. Um, in any rate, in any case, since the Enlightenment, since 18th century um, Germany, when the first free universities uh, were created, um, which um, again were free as in speech, not free as in beer, um, where the point was that these universities. Um, and the scholars within them, um, their scholarship had to be independent from um, either the church or government controlling what they were allowed to think or what they were allowed to say. Um, and the way they did this by, was by establishing the need for rational argument. Okay, so when you when you wrote a book, um, unlike you know the previous um, several thousand years of history, when you wrote a book or you made an intellectual statement or publication of one kind or another, you had to um, produce evidence for your claims. Um, you couldn't just say, obviously I'm right because I'm Aristotle, right? And so you, you, know, you, know, you had to give evidence. Um, you had to give reproducible evidence and, and methodology so that other people could um, test what you're claiming and um, follow up on it. And you had to cite previous scholarship so that um, A, it gives credit to people whose ideas you're building on, and um, B, that people can look at how your work is uh, and your, your ideas are interacting with existing ideas and again, test them and, um, and uh, argue with them. Um, so the open scholarly method um, is uh, effectively, or at least for the last several hundred years, has effectively been that a scholar does some research um, and you know takes 20 years to do this research. Let's, let's, let's talk about you know, 18th century Germany when you know, scholars maybe had that luxury. Um, writes a book, there's many citations in this book, the book is published, Another generation later, I said 30 years later, but it could be 100 years later, a second scholar comes along, reads the book, follows some of the citations and looks at some of the earlier publications in it, reproduces the experimental methodology. Um, the language there suggests that this is physics, but it's similar if we were talking about a book in you know, linguistics or uh, you know, historical argument. Um, may disagree with the results, do new research, publish a new book, and among the citations includes scholar, um, the first scholar, right? And this then is a collaboration. They've, they've, um, the, the new book is the result not only of scholar B's research, but of both scholars' research. And so they've collaborated. Um, traditionally, of course, the second book only had scholar B's name on the spine, not both. Um, but it is, in a sense, a collaboration. Um, in, in, in very much the same sense that open source software is scholar A and B never met, in this case, because scholar A died before scholar B read their book, but um, uh, it's, it's the same principle over a different time span as um, open source software. And so the scholarly method, and I've given three examples of scholarly method on this slide and the following one, in, exper in experimental physics, in um, theoretical literary criticism, you know, is that you cite earlier theory or you cite earlier critics, you credit your collaborators, you credit other proponents of the theory, you document your argumentation or your experimental method, you footnote everything to give credit to, um, to previous people whose ideas um, 
you worked on that to make your, uh, your, your theory and your argument uh, reproducible, um, to make sure other people can, going from the evidence, come to the same conclusion as you and come to a different conclusion than you. Um, and uh, so from, from, our, um, from our perspective, the third example is the one that's, uh, that I think is the most, um, the most useful here um, and is, is, is kind of uh, a nice um, in-between um, road between experimental physics and uh, theoretical literary criticism, which is in classical philology. Um, we, when we edit a text, we have an apparatus criticus where we cite um, both the manuscript variants upon which we've based our work and um, scholarly differences and scholarly attribution for some of the readings that we have in our in our edition. So, you know, I read this word um, on uh, line 17, um, but previous scholars read a different word. Or I read this word on line 17, which was first suggested by another scholar. I give credit to that scholar because I don't want to pretend that I that I invented that. We have a bibliography to to give credit for these things. We um, have a historical commentary which argues for our current interpretation. This is what makes it reproducible. Um, and we publish all the raw data that we can, photographs, facsimiles, the comparanda from other texts that help us make our linguistic arguments. And in an ideal world, at least, classical ed ed editions of classical texts, philological editions of classical texts, are republished regularly um, over over time. Regularly can mean um, you know every couple of years for some very popular inscriptions, for example, or it can mean you know maybe every fifty years for a less um, a less popular classical author. But nevertheless, these things are re-edited again and again, um, and they improve each time. And there is again this collaboration between generations of editors working on this. And so, um, as um, as I've already argued, this the slide just summarizes. Um, this scholarly method that we use is open source software, basically, right? It's asynchronous collaboration. It and our publications allow reuse within certain parameters, right? So when I write a scholarly book, um, I'm allowing and I'm expecting people to reuse my content in certain ways that you know the author of a novel is not necessarily expecting people to reuse their content without their permission, right? I'm expecting people to quote me. I'm expecting people to disagree with me. I'm expecting people to build on my um, uh, my academic output. Um, attribution is required, if not literary plagiarism. The source code, um, that is to say, the, um, the the methodology by which I came to um, these uh, these conclusions, are distributed along with the binaries. Right, the binaries in software are the finished product. In in scholarship, it's the it's the argument where I say this is what I think happened um, on this particular date in the fifth century BC. I say how I got there as well as um, as well as just what my conclusions are. Um, in digital scholarship, I want to, um, to just sort of finish by saying um, this is in increasingly important because when, when you publish digital research, um, especially when you publish it, um, the results of digital research in a digital form, which is particularly useful, um, the, um, the underlying data and the underlying code are no longer metaphors for the source um, materials that you use um, and the methodology for your um, research, they are literally data files. You may have a database, you may have XML files, you may have some other kind of um, source files um, containing you know, classical texts um, that you've processed to reach your conclusions. And the code is not just your um, academic methodology, but it is literally software code, right? It is literally algorithms um, written in a programming language that process your source data in some way to give you conclusions. Both of those need to be made available. Um, they need to be open source so that other people can take them and reuse them and adapt them without having to ask your permission for them, right? Because otherwise you're not, um, you're not being a good post-enlightenment scholar. You're not making this material available for, for other ac academics to, um, to, to build on and disagree with. Um, and finally, two points, it's important to, uh, to give attribution to everybody who's involved. So I've um, cited the Creative Commons um, license, the most uh, uh, standard Creative Commons license is the CC BY, the attribution license, um, where um, that's a short definition of it. And I've highlighted, um, you know, you may reuse this work only if you give credit to the original author. So you can't pretend it's yours, uh, but you must give credit and you must give credit to everybody. Okay, not just to the person who wrote the paper, but to everybody who was involved in the research that led to that, including the people who created the data that you used to come to these um, sorts of um, conclusions that you come to. And the final point um, about these open licenses, um, and I've highlighted a different part 
um, of the um, Creative Commons license here, um, is that you this license explicitly lets other people copy, distribute, and display this copyrighted work. Um, so you don't give up copyright, but you do waive some of what is normally um, uh, locked down by copyright by um, allowing people to um, to reuse, redistribute, and to modify and create derivative works based on your work. Which, as I say, this is normal academic, academic activity. This is what we do. Um, if we don't um, distribute um, the, the source code, and if we don't give attribution to everybody who's um, uh, involved, and if we don't uh, license our um, data and software openly for people to reuse, um, then we are not footnoting our work, we are not properly documenting our work, um, and we are not producing scholarly work. Um, and this is particularly important, as I say, in, in digital work. Anything we do digitally is, is literally open source as well as, uh, as, well as figuratively open source. Uh, so, so, so I argue in any case. Okay, um, I went on for a little bit longer than I intended to there, so I'll hand over to Lucia, I think, next. Lucia? You'll need to unmute yourself, Lucia. Yes, yes. Gotcha, yeah. Okay, let me share my slides. Can you see my slides? Not yet. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, put your screen now. So, um, so one of the main trends in digital classics and digital humanities is to digitize historical components such as ancient books, manuscripts or letter exchanges. However, archives and libraries usually constitute an enormous amount of data that can't be dealt with by individual researchers. Therefore, communities of people can be involved and asked to interact for enriching digital collections, a phenomenon often referred to as crowdsourcing. This is a neologism that combines the words crowds and outsourcing. It was originally the act of taking work performed within an organization and outsourcing it to the general public through an open call for past participants. Within the broader category of crowdsourcing, we find a group of academic crowdsourcing, also called the citizen science, a form of research collaboration involving members of the public in humanities or scientific projects. This is quite different from commercial crowdsourcing. A critical distinction is participants' motivation. In citizen science project, motivation is not a material recompense, but something more intrinsic to the activity, the interest in the subject. Other distinctive factors of citizen science projects, especially in the humanities, are the presence of a clearly defined research question, usually formulated by an academic team as part of a larger scientific project. And this differs from platforms like Google Earth, which concern the creation of general user-generated content. And then the added value provided by the volunteers to the existing primary sources, like transcriptions, of or annotation to the texts, and the existence of well-defined tasks like transcribing, tagging, or commenting, rather than more passive ways of participation. The activity and the amount um, of data are scalable to allow participants with different levels of knowledge, including non-expert users, to accomplish the tasks. 
Technology has enabled this model crowdsourcing, but models for public participation in collection, research and observation predate it. An instance of proto-crowdsourcing is the Oxford English Dictionary, whose editor James Murray launched an appeal to the English-speaking and English-reading public in 1879. He invited the public to provide evidence for the history and usage of words, so as to contribute to the completion of the dictionary. Now, advances in digital humanities have added further value to these traditional models of collaborative editing, thanks to the ability to provide almost instantaneous data gathering and feedback, to computationally validate contributions, to track data provenance, and to verify primary sources, aspects that are all particularly important for scholarly projects. Modern crowdsourcing is a product of the cultural shift in internet technologies. From the first generation of the web dominated by static websites, whose search engines only allowed information seeking, to the web 2.0, which has encouraged a dialogue and the public participation through the development of interactive online platforms. It's therefore clear that uh, crowdsourcing has been used not only once a project is accomplished to disseminate its results to the public, but also during the research process itself, in order to help scholars work on corpora that are too extensive for only one person or team to edit them properly. Furthermore, there are activities that can be better performed by human observers than by even powerful computer systems, as they require a great accuracy, typically the recognition of patterns, especially among irregular shapes. For example, the recognition of letter forms in handwritten documents, as handwriting is more irregular than printed text. And this is why transcription of manuscripts is a typical activity asked for in crowdsourced projects. And so starting from the need of help to build, edit and classify a substantial body of texts, crowdsourcing has also achieved another critical objective, strengthening a sense of community and collaboration in the public and communicating our research beyond the academia to less specialist audiences in new and more accessible ways. Now I show some projects from the area of classics, which support the view that uh, not only do crowdsourced projects allow interested people, even outside of the traditional recent environments, to become more engaged with scholarly materials, but they also produce reliable information, maintaining the high quality standards required by scholarship, if contributors are put in the right condition to do so, also thanks to digital methods. A unique case in classics is the Ancient Lives project of the University of Oxford. This resource, which ran between 2011 and 2014, was explicitly designed for non-experts and devised to involve uh, any interested individual in the transcription of Greek papyrus fragments, even if they had no training in papyrology or Greek. Ancient Lives appealed to the general public for help in transcribing ancient Greek papyri unearthed from the Egyptian desert. The task performed by participants was uh, engaging and uh, facilitated by a user-friendly environment. With the aid of a virtual keyboard with Greek characters, which assisted to recognize the shape of the letters on the papyrus, users attempted to transcribe the letters they would see on the digital images of the fragments Ancient Lives users were thus able to produce very good transcriptions. 
as well as the creation of a database of unpublished the Greek texts, another important outcome is that ancient lies provided public access to data that was for a century viewed by few scholars, thereby proposing a different model from traditional scholarship. This open collaborative transcription was of course subject to the project editor's editorial vetting, as happens in other open collaborative platforms in classics, as we'll see. However, Ancient Lies differs from them in addressing to the wider public by adopting the citizen science method with a strong social engagement, which is new in this area. Other platforms for collaborative editing in classics address other kinds of users. Although they still make use of crowdsourcing, they appeal to smaller and specific groups of participants, namely communities of scholars or students. An example of a project that makes use of contributions from the scholarly community is the Paparological Editor tool of the Papari.info database. Papari.info is an extensive digital text collection of Greek, of Greek and Latin documentary papyri, a typology of text that include, among others, accounts, tax receipts, letters, and other documents of ancient everyday life. This resource is composed of two core elements, the Papariological Navigator, a tool to browse and search the texts, and the Papariological Editor to contribute to the collection. The content, the text of the papyri and their metadata, was originally obtained from the aggregation of pre-existing databases. Now, new texts and metadata, or corrections to the existing records, are added through users' contribution, with a procedure that includes an editorial vetting in order to meet scholarly standards. Although anyone can sign up and become a contributor, there is a filter represented by the knowledge of Greek and papyrological conventional signs, so that the contribution of specialists is in practice necessary to have valuable content. This model has been called community-based crowdsourcing or community sourcing or else community science as opposed to citizen science. Even though there is a membership potentially open to everyone, it is in fact more closed to those who have the necessary expertise, unlike the broader crowdsourcing, which resorts to open calls for participation. Another project that addresses the scholarly community for contributions is Sematia by the University of Helsinki, which employs the Aretusa annotation tool of the Perseids platform. Perseids allows editing and uh, translating uh, ancient texts, as well as adding annotations to them. Annotating means adding information that is also machine readable to text uh, items, so usually to words, uh, which are the basic text uh, unit. A typical example of annotation is the linguistic one. This consists in um, encoding a text corpus by tagging words with syntactic, morphological and semantic information so that uh, an automated linguistic analysis can be performed. Linguistic annotation is also called tree bank as a text so encoded presents uh, a tree-like shape to visually render the syntactic uh, dependency between words, as we can see in this example of a tree bank, the sentence from the Aretusa platform. So in Sematia, Aretusa is employed for annotating documentary papyri downloaded from the papyrological navigator of papyri.info. The aim is to build up a corpus of tree banked papyri 
so as to help scholars examine the features of the language of this important uh, body of evidence for Greek and Latin language in their post-classical phases, uh, when they also got in contact with uh, other languages of the Mediterranean. And um, lastly, uh, a few collaborative uh, editing platforms can be considered as uh, intermediate between the two previous ones in that they ask for contributions from uh, groups of university students. So embedding the use of collaborative editing platforms in teaching. These projects differ from the others as they address uh, a more restricted community than general crowdsourcing a group of students participating in a class but one that is uh, larger and less specialized than the scholarly community involved uh, in community science projects. And also, as this crowdsourcing is practiced uh, in a classroom setting, it arises pedagogical questions on the changing of teaching methods and on the relationship between teaching and uh, scholarship. And Perseids um, has been used in classes of medieval Latin at uh, Tufts University. Uh, undergraduate students worked uh, on a group of unpublished, handwritten or printed leaves recently discovered in the Tisch Miscellany collection of Tufts University Library. Each student chose a leaf to transcribe edit and translate by means of proceeds. Their contributions were then uploaded on the Tisch Miscellany collection online catalog. And so, as well as completing an assignment, the students uh, began to take part in professional grade research and in the dissemination of knowledge. And one more example of the incorporation of perceives in teaching, but within an area, another area of studies and with the aid of another resource of this platform, <coughs> is the use of the mentioned Aretusa tool for grammatical annotation. Three banking Greek literary texts to teach Greek language and literature has proved to be a powerful pedagogical instrument. Students were led to reflect on the possible ways of constructing the syntactic tree of a sentence and uh, to discuss about the arguments in favor of each alternative. In this way, students were also actively participating in the creation of the ancient Greek uh, dependency tree bank corpus, thereby producing an essential contribution to an important initiative for data-driven linguistic research. <coughs> and an activity similar to the collaborative editing of manuscripts carried out at Tufts University occurs within the Homer multi-text project of the Center for Hellenic Studies of Harvard University. They use contributions from undergrad undergraduate students for transcribing, collating, and indexing primary source material, namely in manuscripts of the Iliad. However, this differs from the Tufts undergraduate research project, as they utilize another editing tool, which is specifically um, created for this single resource, a virtual machine containing all the software necessary for contributors to edit the material and for editors to validate the contributions. The aim of the Homer multi-text project is to present the complete textual transmission of the Homeric poems by building a collection of texts and images of all their papyri and medieval manuscripts so as to give account of the forms uh, the poems assumed over the centuries in different phases of their tradition. 
The students were assigned uh, the task of transcribing specific passages of five manuscripts of the Iliad, highlighting variants. They noted in the XML file with the manuscript text the variants from the chosen reference edition of the Iliad, and uh, following the EPIDOC guidelines, they marked up uh, scribal corrections and uh, other editorial interventions of the original. <coughs> Another task was um, to create indices of three manuscripts of the Iliad of which uh, digital images had uh, newly been produced according to a specific notational system for citing digital texts, the Canonical Text Service Uniform Resource Name. So the folio sides of each manuscript were associated with images of that folio. And the lines of the Iliad written with uh, that reference system were associated with the folios and the manuscripts where they occur. The undergraduate fellows of the Homer Multitext project had therefore the chance to directly engage with the philological activities and with important uh, witnesses of the tradition of the Homeric text. They knew that their task was not only an exercise, but also a work of a real value for scholarship, which people will discover and read. And so, in, um, in conclusion, uh, these examples highlight the fact that uh, crowdsourcing has been used uh, for classics and humanities projects, not merely as a cheap way to speed up the process of digitization or enhancing of a collection. Uh, but the different point of view brought by the crowd, be it the wider public or the scholarly community or uh, university students, uh, their creativity and uh, enthusiasm have been acknowledged as an additional value brought by crowdsourcing as a research method in its wide variety of projects. And uh, moreover, digital humanities can provide students with technical skills that can be used in their future workplace, where they can also contribute to technological innovation. Great, thank you, Lucia. That's um, that's really good because not only is this a, a great summary of um, crowdsourcing in academic projects, but it, it looks forward to several of the topics in future weeks where we talk about some of these um, these same issues. So um, that's a really useful, really useful summary. That gives a lot to, to talk about. Thanks. Uh, let's let's hand over to Emma. Thank you for the introduction, Gabby. Um, I will just share with you my screen. <clears throat> Is that working? Yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to start by talking specifically about Wikipedia um, as a way of collaborative editing. So I'll begin by talking about some general issues relating to Wikipedia and its potential and its limitations as a crowdsourcing project. And also about how and why academics, people in academia might get involved with editing Wikipedia. Um, then I'm going to focus particularly on one key issue which relates to representation on Wikipedia and that is its gender imbalance. And then finally I'll talk about one specific collaborative project, the Women's Classical Committee UK's recent and ongoing work to increase the representation of women classicists on Wikipedia. And as we go along I'll share some tips on getting started with editing and so on for those who might not be uh, familiar with it yet. And the practical exercise this week will actually involve creating or improving a Wikipedia page. Um, so some basic kind of statistics about Wikipedia um, and bear in mind I'm going to be talking about the English language Wikipedia. Obviously there are, um, Wikipedia uh, does exist in other languages as well, but this is the one with which I've been working and with which I'm most familiar. Um, so English language Wikipedia currently has more than five and a half million articles, around 600 new articles are created every single day and on average 
more than 10 edits, individual edits are made every second. As a crowdsourcing model, it does have several advantages. It's free to use. It's easy to learn how to edit. You don't need any prior knowledge of coding. It's very, very quick to make corrections or adjustments. And anyone with access to the internet can use it and edit it. Although, of course, here we do need to bear in mind that there are still significant portions of the world who don't have internet access. And that means, for example, that the Global North is far better represented um, on Wikipedia than the Global South. And it's also worth remembering that censorship of Wikipedia does still exist in several countries. Um, so I'd like to think about why it might be important for academics and students to engage with Wikipedia as a means of accessing and sharing knowledge and information. So consider how often you carry out a generic internet search and the first result that comes up is actually a page of Wikipedia. If you're searching for information relating to your own academic work, you might well scroll past that result because you're looking for something more specialised. Or you might actually use it as your first port of call to get a brief overview of a new topic that you're not yet familiar with. But think about how many people have no need ever to look beyond that first result in their search and then think about how influential that can make Wikipedia as a source of information. So if the information there is inaccurate or out of date, if it's got gaps in it, or if at worst it's heavily biased, there's a danger that readers gain an incomplete or misleading impression of the topic being discussed. So by editing pages that relate to their own areas of expertise, academics can help to ensure accurate coverage. Importantly too, representation on Wikipedia can be a way of improving the visibility of particular topics or groups, and that's something that I'll come back to to talk about a bit more later. Now, it used to be the case that lecturers would tell their students, ignore Wikipedia because anyone can contribute to it and they can write anything they like. Now, I suspect anecdotally that many do still say this, but in reality, Wikipedia has moved on from its earliest incarnations and it's much more heavily invested now in ensuring that its information is reliable and importantly traceable. So one of the first rules for editing Wikipedia, which might run counter to the instincts and training of scholars, is that it is not a place for sharing original research. So what this means is that in reality, every entry should be fully referenced. And this comes back to what Gabby was, was saying earlier about, about collaboration of scholarship and showing your workings, really. Um, so everything needs citations relating to information that has been published elsewhere in reliable sources. Um, these might be web-based or they might be in print, but a good Wikipedia entry will have a full bibliography and references. And you'll see the blue links on the slides here um, where um, when, we, when we make those available, you'll be able to click through to find some information about what Wikipedia means by a reliable source and so on. So every, everything should be backed up by a reference to its source. So you will find that articles that don't have enough citations will be flagged. So I'll give you an example of one of those now. Um, if you have a look at this one, um, it's got a little kind of um, box flagging the problem that it doesn't, the article doesn't cite any sources. Um, can you see this on your screen? Can Gabby just confirm that? Yeah. Yeah, yep. great, fantastic. Okay. Um, so they need someone to basically have a look and, and add some citations to some reliable sources. You'll also notice that at the bottom it says that this is a, a stub article about ancient Greek history and you can help by expanding it. So it might be the case that you've, you've come across an article like this and you think, well, actually, I know a little bit about, I've, I've got access to um, the Oxford Classical Dictionary, for example, or I've got access to, I know which ancient text this features in. I can add some more information and I can give the citations, which will help to make this a more complete article. So as it happens, I've I've had a look at this one and, and I've kind of figured out where it where the original source is for this material. And it's actually a bit of Thucydides. So I will just briefly um, add that citation. Now I'm signed into my uh, Wikipedia account, so I can do that. So I just need to click up here where it says, edit source and there are two ways of doing it there's there's one um type of editing which basically shows you all all the code behind the editing um but if you click up here um you can also do the kind of visual editing which looks exactly like it looks on the page which for simplicity's sake is quite useful um so we'll we'll have a look at this now so um so i just want to add a citation here and this first sentence so someone can follow it up and find out where it's from so i'm going to pop my cursor there and click on site. Um, 
And you'll see when the citation box appears, there are various options here. Now, if you wanted to give details of a secondary source, for example, and you clicked on book, you can give a whole load of detailed publication information that any user can then follow up um, right down to pages cited, ISBN and so on. But what we actually want to do here is um, a little bit more simple than that. Um, I'm just going to use the basic form here because I'm going to give a, a short reference to an ancient text and it's from um, from Thucydides 391. And the other thing I'm going to do before I leave is I'm actually going to also just highlight Thucydides and give a hyperlink there to Thucydides Wikipedia page um, so that someone who comes to this fresh not knowing anything about who Thucydides is can then follow up that reference if they want to and find out a little bit more about the source itself. Um, I'll click on insert and it's appeared there. Um, and then all I need to do is, is publish my changes by going up to the top right and clicking on the blue publish changes button. And it asks me to describe what I changed um, here. I'm just going to say I added a citation. It, it's probably going to need some more detailed citation that page anyway, but just to give you an idea of so we've we've you know we've made a start there on making you know making it useful, making making people able to be follow up, follow up. Um, the information there and I can publish those changes and there's our little note and it also appears at the bottom of the page as a footnote as well. Um, so that's just one example of something that you can do to help improve uh, the information that's, that's available on Wikipedia. Um, but in addition to citing reliable sources. It's really important that articles on Wikipedia are representative of a neutral point of view. That is that they ought to represent fairly and as far as possible without editorial bias, all significant views that have been published by reliable sources on the topic. Now, again, that's something that doesn't always come completely naturally um, when we might be used to having to make a case for taking a particular stance on an issue. Um, and again, there's there's lots of useful information in Wikipedia linked linked on my slide that, that sort of explains what, what is a neutral point of view and how we how we create that. And, and editors do go through articles and they will get flagged if they are seen to be heavily biased. Um, and then you know the, the adjustments will need to be made. Now in recognition of the importance that's now being placed on academics engaging with Wikipedia, some universities and academic libraries actually have now appointed Wikipedians in residence or Wikimedians in residence, whose job it is to liaise with academics and to run training on editing Wikipedia and discussing things like conflict of interest and so on. Um, so recently, the Wellcome Trust Library, the Bodleian in Oxford, the University of Edinburgh and the British Library have all engaged in this way with Wikipedia to demonstrate their, their commitment to uh, working collaboratively to improve it. And there's also been a shift in teaching at university level as well. So, for example, some lecturers now set tasks involving editing Wikipedia in class or as part of assessment. Um, and this can, there's a recognition, of course, that that can help with research skills, with analysing and assessing source material and with summarising information for a specific audience. Um, now, the vast majority of people who work to improve Wikipedia are volunteers. So it really is crowdsourcing on a grand scale. And it does illustrate something that Lucia was talking about earlier, which is the power of harnessing the public's time and knowledge. But it still remains true that almost anyone can edit Wikipedia. And this does produce some particular issues in terms of how things are represented and who and what is represented in the encyclopedia. The dominant social and cultural characteristics of the body of people who do edit Wikipedia can, in some cases, lead to imbalanced coverage of some subjects and some perspectives. So um, the average Wikipedian is, on, on the English Wikipedia at least, is male, um, is aged between 15 to 49, has a formal education, is usually from a developed nation. And those kinds of characteristics can all influence uh, what kind of content we find on Wikipedia. So it can lead to a certain bias in relation to, for example, gender, race, social class, as well as a tendency to underrepresent perspectives of those who don't have access to the internet or who, or who don't have the free time to edit Wikipedia. Um, but the issue that I'm going to focus on 
particularly today and the rest of what I have to say is that of the Wikipedia gender imbalance because this is the issue of which I've got the most direct experience of working with. Um, now the gender imbalance works manifests itself in two clear ways for which statistics have been gathered. First is in relation to the gender of contributors and second is in relation to the number of biographies. Um, again this does manifest in slightly different ways in, in Wikipedia in languages other than English. Um, the most recent surveys have suggested that only between around 9 and 16 percent of Wikipedia editors are actually women, although there are suggestions that the manner in which the evidence is gathered has an effect on the precise percentage, which is why there's a range there between 9 and 16 percent. It depends which, which type of survey you look at. And if you click on the link... Could you, could you just click hide on the, um, on the Google Hangouts? Oh, sorry, bottom, yes. Because that's, that's hiding no, the numbers. Right. Cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. Um, so if you, if you click on the link here, there's a there's a useful article there which explains a lot about um, the methodologies relating to different surveys that have that have come up with these statistics. In terms of the number of biographies which we find on Wikipedia, um, the most recent statistics shown here suggest that just under 18% of the total number of Wikipedia biographies, there are about one and a half million biographies on English language Wikipedia in total, 18% um, or le slightly less than 18% of those are of have women as their subjects. Um, this is a screenshot from the Wikidata Human Gender Indicators site, and again, I've, I've given you the link here to that. And it's worth having a look at that if this is something you're interested in, because it's it's worth playing around with. They have lots of visualizations which show you month by month changes. You can hover over the dots for each language and get more information and more context for precise statistics and so on. So I, I would urge you to have a look at that if you have time. Um, it's not just about numbers though and statistics, but the gender bias also manifests itself in the content of biographies and the ways in which women are written about. So we tend to find that women are sometimes overlooked in narratives or references to notable women are made in relation to their husband or other male relatives rather than to them in their own right. We find phrasing like adult women being referred to as girls or ladies often um, the word man is used as, as a default description of all humans, um, which is problematic. And we tend to find that in descriptive accounts, women being referred to simply as the women rather than by any official or significant roles like the committee or the founders or so on. Um, in addition, published work written by women is less likely to be cited on Wikipedia than that written by men. So if we can tackle some of these issues of systemic bias collaboratively, then we can start to correct some of these oversights, we can start to work to create more bi biographies of women and we can make women more visible and their achievements more visible um, on Wikipedia. Now there have been recently been quite a lot of projects that have been initiated which aim to tackle precisely this systemic bias. Uh, Wikipedia's own initiative is the Women in Red project which is worth a look. It has a, a long list of notable women who need pages creating about them and the aim is to turn the red links, those which don't yet have an entry, into blue links with pages populated by content. Uh, women in Red's also led to several related projects with a focus on women from particular regions or in particular specialisms. So for example in connection with Wikipedia Asian Month there was a particular focus on writing biographies of Asian women and there are various discipline specific wiki projects which focus on for example things like women artists or women associates with particular academic disciplines. The project that I've been most closely involved with is one which aims to tackle the lack of representation of women classical scholars on Wikipedia. It was initiated by the UK Women's Classical Committee in January 2017, so just about a year ago. Before the project began, there were about 200 biographies of classicists in English on the site, but only but less than 10% of these actually had women as their subjects. So part of WCC UK's mission is to advance equality and diversity in the field. And one way of doing this is to increase the visibility of women classical scholars through projects like this one. So with support from Wikipedia trainers, we began holding regular monthly editing sessions, most of which involve participants joining online, although occasionally we do hold face-to-face -face meetups as well. The main aim of the sessions is to increase the number of biographies of women classical scholars on Wikipedia and to make improvements to those which were already present but which were lacking in detail. It's really important to mention, however, that all entries must meet Wikipedia's notability criteria. Um, 
you can't just write an article on Wikipedia about anybody. Um, by definition, for academics, the notability criteria means that individuals must have made a significant and demonstrable contribution to scholarship. So in the UK, for example, an appointment as professor is good evidence of that. Although in other countries, the ranking system for academics might differ. And again, there's a link there that explains a little more about, about what, what's classed as a, as a notable individual under, um, under Wikipedia's rules. Um, it's also important to ensure when editing that there's no conflict of interest, which might compromise the editor's neutrality. So for example, you can't or you shouldn't edit an entry about your own work and nor should you be writing about someone with whom you have a professional professional or a personal relationship. So, for example, writing about close colleagues or things like um, research supervisors would contravene Wikipedia's guidance on this. Um, the WCC project also works to ensure that the work of women scholars is cited on relevant subject pages on Wikipedia, as well as helping to make these women become more visible by sort of cross-linking to their biographies on other pages. Um, there's one particularly notable example that we noticed at the very start of the project. So um, the scholar Miriam Griffin was only mentioned on Wikipedia on her husband Jeff Jasper Griffin's extensive Wikipedia page, despite her own significant contribution to scholarship. Um, and she's now got a page which is devoted to her as a scholar in her own right, and we'll, we'll take a look at that shortly. Um, it's a project that's produced really uh, clear results in a relatively short space of time. I'll, again, I'll show you in a moment the list of pages that have been created or improved since the project began. So it's a really good example of the way in which collaborative work can make a task that seems at first to be hugely overwhelming to be much more manageable. Individual contributors can offer as much or as little time as they feel able. They can work on the project when it's convenient for them, although if they want to feel part of the community, they have the option of joining in when a synchronous session is running. Uh, we advertise all of these using the, the project pages and by tweeting using the hashtag uh, WCC Wiki, which is at the top of the slide. Um, so just to finish off, I'll give you a brief tour, I think, of the WCC project page um, and uh, show you one, one of the pages that we've created. Um, and you'll also you'll find some more links uh, about getting started with edit editing on the Sinochesis resources page for, for this seminar. So let's just take a quick look. So this is our project, our main project page, um, where you'll find we're actually um, keeping a running list of everything, all the articles that have been improved or created each month since we started. Um, and it's quite satisfying uh, to recognize that um, we've actually in the time, I think, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there were fewer than 20 percent, fewer than, I think there was something like 17 women, biographies of women classical scholars to start with. There are now, we've since created more than 50 and improved a whole lot more. Um, so worth having, worth having a look at that to see just how, how far this has gone in, in a relatively short space of time and with a relatively small number of contributors. Um, under the AIMS tab, we also maintain a page which shares the elements of the project that we're currently working on or that we would like people to help to work on. So these are categorised according to whether we want, whether things need minor expansion or minor editing, often with a little note that says what needs what needs doing with it, um, right down to things that need major changes making. And here a long, long list and an ever expanding list of new pages that need creating. So if, for example, you are um, you know of someone who doesn't have a Wikipedia page who you think is is not worthy enough to have one, then by all means drop in and, and add their name to this list, and um, and hopefully you know these these get picked up, and the red links eventually turn blue. If you want to um, create a new page from one of these, you just simply need to click on it, and it gives you um, your new page to create, and you can make a start. So any contributions, however small, do do accumulate. Um, everything else should be fairly self-explanatory, I think, from, from the page. Um, a discussion page where we kind of flag up issues that, that might have arisen over the course of the editing, so anything that anyone across the project would benefit from, from um, knowing about. A few tools and guides, which you probably find worth, worth dropping into as well, actually. Um, here we leave kind of freely available resources that might be useful for the project. 
but also there are some general guides to editing Wikipedia. This one here is particularly useful for getting started if it's something that you've not done before. Um, and then finally, a page which lists upcoming events and also a link to the chat channel that we use uh, when we're editing. Uh, this needs updating because we haven't yet fixed the date for the next event. Um, so just briefly to finish, one quick look at a page that we have that was created. This is the page I mentioned earlier. Uh, Miriam Griffin only had a mention on, on Jasper Griffin's page rather than a page of her own. And you'll see that in the course of the project, she's now got a relatively substantial page with quite a detailed bibliography um, and a good long list of references backing up the information about her biography. Um, very briefly, it's often worth looking when you look at a page and it's something that if you create your own page, you might want to keep an eye on as well. Have a quick look at the history page, which just gives you a little insight into how much lies behind the creation of this page. So if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see that it was originally created on the 23rd of January last year, which was the, the first um, WCC Wikipedia event. And you can kind of see the sort of conversations that have gone on. It's often quite useful to see why people have, have deleted things or changed things or added things. Um, and that's it's, it's often worth looking. What you, the other thing you can do here is you can compare particular revisions as well, just to see what changes have been made recently. Um, so I think that's all from me for now, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's anything that isn't clear or that you'd like to know more about. Great, thanks, Alan. That's really good. That's really good. Really good. Uh, um, the, yeah, so, so um, any, anyone have any, um, anything you want to add to any of that? Any, any questions or comments from anybody? I mean, the one thing we could talk about very briefly is the way in which we might suggest that, um, that students might uh, edit Wikipedia as part of the exercise for this session. As, um, as Emma mentioned, um, we have, um, uh, if I can just share the screen just quickly, um, we have suggested um, the, uh, the, the exercise on the um, Sonokis um, wiki page there. Um, that uh, you first read this very um, short and very simple article about um, uh, how to edit Wikipedia, uh, which are um, which I think is a useful summary of um, of what uh, Emma's talked about. Um, and then um, it's really up to you what sort of um, work you want to try to do on Wikipedia um, as a as a contribution here. Um, and maybe depending a little bit on, on your experience and confidence with this as well. So we've given a few suggestions down here. Um, there is a link, um, as Emma pointed out, to the, um, uh, the, the WCC page for um, a list of women classicists who either don't yet have Wikipedia pages or whose Wikipedia pages need improving. And um, if you were interested in um, going in and uh, improving one of those or creating one of those, um, you know, um, as classicists, it's probably quite easy for us to find the resources we need to write a basic page about, about one of these people. Um, there's also, um, if, you, if you don't really feel up to creating a new page, um, we've um, given just below that in point two, um, a few links to um, what uh, Wikipedia calls stub pages. So there are under the stub page for Greek mythology, there's um, a few dozen, um, in fact, a uh, hundred and there's 676, in fact, um, Greek mythology topics and 177 Greek deities whose pages are just stubs. So if your interest is in Greek religion, you could easily go through there, find someone um, in there who, um, you know, if you, you think, well, yeah, I know, I know all about Melete, um, you know, I could, I could definitely give a summary of Melete Greek mythology, you know, go ahead and do that, bearing in mind all of the issues of um, neutral tone of voice, no original research and, and good um, citation. That, um, that Emma's mentioned. Um, and likewise, we've got lists, um, links to you know, Roman mythology, um, uh, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, Greek writers, there's others you can, you can search for yourself for historical topics, um, archeological topics. Um, if you really wanted, um, uh, you could maybe for a slightly more ambitious 
um, project, you could look at one of the topics that we're studying in this module and see if there's a Wikipedia page for that that could be improved or created. Um, you know, write write more about the you know the ancient Greek and um, Roman Tribek, um, for example, which doesn't have a page of its own. Um, that um, that sort of thing. But maybe for this week, we'd start with something simpler. Um, and finally, in point three at the bottom there, um, we've um, um, linked to um, and is this on the uh, no, this is a category of uh, Greece and Rome articles that need expert attention um, of one kind or another. So if someone has flagged these pages and said, you know, I'm not sure what's going on here, and an expert needs to come along and, and say this. And so, you know, maybe these are um, these are a little bit. Some of these are a little bit um, specific. But um, I guess if you if you are the expert on your ergotism and you want to come along and improve that page, they 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 would really like that. I mean, there's only 12 of those, so. Maybe the chances of us, of us being experts in all of those things are, are relatively small. But, but those are the possibilities, and you can you know you can find other other kinds of pages that need improvement or whatever. But the point of this is really to um, to not just to do the, the technical task of you know clicking on edit and making sure you get references working right, but also to engage with the the Wikipedia rules and guidelines and, and community as a whole. Because if you if you create a new page, you will certainly will get someone commenting on that page. Um, and if you create a page with no footnotes in it whatsoever, someone will probably come along and say, you know, how do we know this is true? If you haven't footnoted it, um, they might not do so within minutes. They might uh, if you're unlucky or lucky. Um, but um, so that, that's 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 a sort of um, uh, and, and you know ideally you will have questions, things that you're not sure um, how you should handle um, and so forth. Um, and that's the sort of thing you could you know you could bring to your your tutor. Um, could I just give one one little tip on if you are creating a new page and you're not quite sure how to go about it, a really useful thing to do is to find a page that's similar. So if you want to create a biography, find another biography and kind of literally copy and paste the structure of that page into your new page. Obviously, then you're going to need to change the content, but it's it's useful just so you can kind of you've got a model to work from. You're not starting completely from scratch. Um, that's quite a useful um way of, of working as well. The other thing that you can do is create it, um, if I can just share my screen, um, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. You can use your sandbox here, which isn't public. Um, so this is an article that I created quite a long time ago when I was first um, working with Wikipedia. Um, and you can, you can put it in there if you're feeling kind of a bit anxious about actually sharing it with the world yet. And then you can, you can copy it out from your sandbox when you're ready for it to go live. Um, so that's just you know a couple of little small small tips that might be useful. Great, yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's that's a good idea. The sandbox thing in particular is um, it's it's useful not only for um, you know the, the sort of confidence question if you're not sure you want to go public yet, but it's also useful in terms of just not polluting Wikipedia oh. with half finished and and you know not not terribly high quality stuff. There's a comment in the um, in the chats um, here from from Anisa who um, who says Wikipedia pages in Portuguese are much less developed than those in English. Um, so um, that's that's a good um, a good uh, some some you know we could say a couple of things about that briefly. I mean, obviously everything we've said about editing Wikipedia pages and the rules to follow and so forth applies in in whichever language. Um, but a further thing you can do if you're creating a Wikipedia page in one language for which there already exists a page in another language um, is that Wikipedia actually encourage you to start by translating an existing page. Um, so you can actually take the content and you can take all the footnotes and all the references and all the structure and all the citations and everything verbatim from the um, from the English page or you know from the French page or from the Greek page or from the Arabic page or whichever you know whichever you're starting from into um, into another language Wikipedia so um, that would be quite that would be quite um, sort of interesting to see I mean especially um, I mean that would be a further um, a further possibility a fourth possibility right I mean you could create a page from scratch you could edit an existing page or you could translate a page from from another language and that's and that's something we could we could look at in, in all languages I mean we um, you know, you probably find that the English Wikipedia um, has uh, inadequate coverage of classical Arabic um, figures and, and history. Um, and so, you know, having you know, doing doing some copying from the Arabic Wikipedia 
um, for, for you know, people who have the ability to read both languages um, would, would also be a, you know, a, a valuable um, thing to do, and vice versa, get classics topics um, that do exist in other languages into the Arabic Wikipedia would be um, Absolutely. You know, interesting. Um, and so, yeah, both of those um, things are, are you know, possible. And so, yeah, if anybody, if anybody does do any um, exercises in that area you know, with their students or, 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 or yourselves, we'd, uh, we'd love to hear about that um, in, in general in, um, in synergesis. Um, that would be cool. Um, I did want to say, I should have said earlier, it might be a little bit late now, that um, there is um, the possibility to ask questions um, in text chat in the, uh, on the YouTube page. If you're watching this live, as I, as I think a handful of people are, um, if you wanted to leave a comment or ask a question there, there's a text chat to the right of the video that you can, um, uh, you can write in. And we're keeping an eye on that, so if anybody leaves a message there at any point, we'll, um, we'll try to notice it and, and respond to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing I liked about this session was, <coughs> excuse me, how much, how much um, that, uh, as I said before, was um, directly overlaps with other sessions that we've either already had or we're, we're, we're going to have um, in this session. So um, we talked about um, collaborative editing, we talked about um, annotation, which we're going to talk about in two weeks. Um, we talked about um, the uh, so tree banking and other um, approaches to annotating text, which is going to be talked about in more detail in about four or five weeks' time. Um, and so I think the the the, um, the parallels between these are very useful to um, to keep an eye on. Um, and in particular for anybody who's looking to do um, an assessed exercise in this for, um, I know for, for my students, but also some of the other people um, who are using this, um, for those of you who, um, who, uh, who will be assessed for this by, their, um, by the local university, um, designing your own exercise which combines more than one topic um, I think would be um, would be very valuable. Um, you know, we don't have to just say, you know, make your exercise be the creation of a Wikipedia page and all the surrounding um, uh, material and discussion that um, that arises from that. But it could combine, um, you know, working alongside a crowdsourcing project and some tree banking, you know, side by side, or some some annotation of some other kind and some uh, some markup or some, you know, both um, both doing text annotation and uh, translation alignment on a single corpus of text side by side. Um, so, you know, combining, combining multiple um, topics, I think, make, you know, is, is particularly valuable. You know, the, the, the division from one topic to another is a little bit artificial. So uh, I think that would be very cool. And this, this, the, the, these presentations, I think, were, um, were useful for that reason. So thank you both. Any other comments or questions or observations before we finish? Double checking YouTube for any other any questions, but no, don't see any. Okay, then we'll um, we'll thank uh, Lucia and Emma again, and um, we'll see you next week for the session on. I guess it's the first of two sessions on markup. Um, next week, I should have this in front of me to. Um, and sad. So next week is February 8th. Yes, so it's um, myself and Monica Berti and Martina Filosa will um, talk about markup, uh, HTML, XML, and um, Epidoc in various um, contexts. So we'll, uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot and bye. Thank you.